Hi, welcome to the Zoom Room Sessions as part of our Thriving Tribe. Uh, I'm David Francis Moore. I'm Juliette Harvey. And today we are with visual artist Harry Walsh Foreman. Harry, how are you? Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. How's it going? Struggling, like everybody else. You know, like that's what being an artist, you don't become an artist to get um, a monthly salary and a tidy pension. You become an artist because you have something you want to express or need to express in yourself. And this is the language that you find most comfortable to talk with. And in that, society is built around um, monetary wealth and art doesn't really fit into that all that well unless you're a top tier artist so you know your art art is a struggle to get by but you know you adapt to it and you try to find your own way about it and then you know you just hope that you'll you'll have an opening one night and there'll be a, a wealthy old widow there to be your patron you know <laughs> Well, the professional part of it is, is something that I'm still coming to terms with in the way of, um, you know, kind of doing, you know, doing all the kind of the, the taxes, all that kind of mundane day-to-day -day stuff, you know. When you're coming up through college, you're, you know, you're taught about art and you're, you know, you're put in this great environment with other people about creativity and stuff. But it wasn't until I was in the masters that they started talking about the different kind of other aspects to being an artist, that, you know, that you'd have to basically run your own business. And that is something that you kind of, you have to kind of pick up on your own as you're going along because there is no kind of, there's no, um, um, I mean, there's stuff like Visual Artist Ireland, which are great for having these like online courses and meetups during the year and stuff. But there's no kind of um, part of um, part of your college course that is designed about around kind of the career aspect of art. So you're, it's something that I'm still coming to terms with now, you know. But um, yeah, I'm getting there, you know. I'm figuring out, you know. All, this, um, all the boring stuff that you have to do, but you, you know, you try to put try to put a bit of time away every week for it. But does it work? Not really. You're in the studio and you're, you know, and you're in the studio and you're looking at a half finished painting and you think, I could apply for this grant, or I could go back to painting again. <laughs> and I always go back to the painting. <laughs> Well, the aim is has always been to to be able to survive on my art, to be able to get by on the art. You know, the aim is to um, is to have that freedom where you're able to kind of go into the studio and spend a day in the studio and not worry about um, you know, not worry about having to where food money is going to come from and stuff. You know, it's that's the aim of any artist is just. You know, we don't want to make, you know, you don't get into art with the dream of making millions. You get into art with the dream of being able to just kind of be able to focus on it fully, you know. I want to, you know, I suppose that's why, that's why when you're, when you're in art college and stuff, you kind of, you know, it's always, it's always kind of a, a, a dream in the back of your head you're going to be discovered in your degree show and you're going to be like the the new Tracy Emin or something you know and you're just going to kind of you know skate along and everybody's going to love your work whenever you put it out there and you're going to become super famous and wealthy and you're going to have like 20 people making your art for you, you know but I mean the reality of it is it 
never happens, you know, but, or it very rarely happens. You have to be very lucky for that to happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just why what you do, you know. Oh, I've been calling myself an artist since I was five years old, you know. <laughs> I, th- I, I honestly think that when you're an artist, you know it from when you're really young, you know. Like, I was in, I was in third class in primary school, and I had this teacher, and I used to doodle all the time. And she used to hate me doodling, and she used to give out to my parents about me doodling. And, um, you know, it's just because I knew I was, I was an artist, you know. I was in sec- I was, when I was in secondary school, I had a really supportive teacher. And he, was, and he always said, Harry, you're going to become a really, you know, a, a big artist someday. And I've just always, I've always known that this is what I wanted to do, you know, that I wanted to become an artist and I wanted to express myself through art. And it's, I've always called myself an artist, you know. I mean, even when I wasn't, <laughs> even when I was in the, even when I was in secondary school and I was, you know, my mother was secretly probably hoping I'd become a doctor. I was thinking, nah, I'm going to become an artist, you know. You know, I didn't, you know, leaving sir, I didn't, didn't take it as seriously as I should have because I knew I was already, <laughs> I was already going to go to art college. <laughs> My work, uh, I, my work kind of consists of me drawing and painting and creating these installations around kind of the life of the city around us. So, um, yeah, my my inspiration can come from just going out for a walk and seeing like, you know, seeing somebody queuing up for the post office to get their pension, and I think, oh, they have such a a fabulous grizzled face I have to you know I have to try to draw that you know and I think that's why you know I'm, I'm actually this whole corona situation that we're stuck in right now I'm actually finding it strangely um, beneficial for my practice because um, uh, I, I, I have my first solo show coming up it was scheduled to be in November in uh, the courthouse gallery in Clare and Ennis Diamond. And I started the year just after I finished with Futures in the RHA. And I was in the studio and I was working on a few paintings and stuff for open calls and stuff. And I was kind of thinking to myself in the back of my head, oh, I'll have to start working on, um, on the courthouse exhibition. And I was thinking, oh, and I had this kind of, I had, I had, a, it was kind of like a creative block, I think, because there were so many options open for me. And I was thinking, you know, will I go the route of my, my master's show? And will I do like a kind of a, a big installation depicting maybe a journey from Dublin to Clare or something? Or will I stick to Dublin that, that I know and try to do a, a, a piece about that? And I've actually kind of, I think I spent the first two or three days just watching Netflix of the whole thing. But then I just thought to myself, you know, feck it, I'll do some drawings. And I'm doing like loads of kind of preparatory drawings, putting them up on Instagram. And um, I'm actually finding it really helpful for me to do these. And then from these, then I'm planning on um, expanding them into the installation for the show. So I'm thinking that the show will kind of be like a kind of a diary of my life during lockdown. So yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I think I'm in, I'm in kind of a, a good place now where, you know, I'm kind of, I'm s- trying to steer clear of as much news of like or numbers and stuff as I can. And I'm just like, I'm just kind of going out for strolls and then seeing people and trying to absorb kind of images that I come across, you know, in the, online and newspaper or whatever, and trying to kind of, um, I suppose, create this kind of graphic narrative of it. And then I will, when I'm able to get back into the studio, 
I'll kind of unpack what I've done and I'll start, you know, expanding some of them and taking aspects of some of them out and maybe, you know, jiggling stuff around. But I'm finding, again, it was, I'm, I'm actually finding a great focus for great, for creating the show because I have a feeling that if this didn't happen, I'd be kind of running around the courtyard of Palace Projects where my studio is in a panic going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Will I go, <laughs> will I go to Clare for the week to draw people now? Or will I just stay in town and draw people? Um, and uh, I'm just, I'm finding it kind of, yeah, it's just been a great, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's helped kind of focus my thoughts and also getting my work out there. I've come across some, um, on Instagram, uh, I've come across some great kind of online projects like um, the Artist Support Pledge, which was started by this uh, guy in the UK called um, Matthew Burroughs. And, you know, it's just like, um, it's a great kind of, it's also a great aid for artists in this time because, um, you know, you can just do like a, a drawing or a collage or a painting and, um, you put it up for no more, no more than 200 of your currency. So 200 euros here, 200 pounds in the UK. And then once you've sold a thousand euros or a thousand pounds worth of your art, then you pledge to buy someone else's art. So, um, and just like going through and seeing like all this kind of great lockdown art that's kind of coming out of, you know, loads of people are kind of posting up on Instagram, all this great stuff. And, um, you know, luckily a few people have said they really like my art and I've been able to kind of then put, um, bring that forward. And I've got some pieces I've uh, purchased from artists in the UK in the post to me now. So I think, th you know, there's this kind of, um, it's this great kind of a sense of camaraderie between everybody now during this whole thing. And it really, um, you know, it kind of, you know, it, it shows like everybody is in this together, you know, from like, you know, from those um, terrible renditions of Imagine on Instagram to, you know, to like the people studying and, I, I mean, uh, people, you know, in college and NCD at the moment and you know everybody's kind of on equal footing now you know and I'm coming across all this kind of great kind of art online now and it's yeah I'm finding it kind of a strangely inspiring time I suppose even though even though it's it's also a pretty terrible time <laughs>
I, I, th I think I kind of, I need that, I need that space to just kind of close off and then, you know, close the door, sit down, take a breather and then try to digest some of what I've seen, you know? Yeah, my, my work could, you know, it could easily be, I tried to kind of, <clears throat> I mean, I could easily recreate it anywhere, but my work is, because I live here and I'm based here, my work is all about Dublin and it's all about the, the people and the places of Dublin. Um, you know, the specific geographies of like a broken down building or a tag on the wall and, you know, like those delightful women with their carts full of oranges pushing them down Francis Street. You know, I love those little kind of reflections of life, you know. But um, I'm also, when I'm working, I don't want to, um, I don't want to create kind of um, exact representations of people. Um, because I think that's kind of getting into, you know, that's kind of getting into a kind of, I suppose a questionable th t territory, you know. What I, what I love to do is I love to, um, um, you know, I'd be sitting down outside a coffee shop or something and I might see somebody and I'll try to reckon, I'll try to um, memorize a specific part of them, whether it's like a withered chin or furrowed eyebrows and stuff. And then I'll try to recreate that in the studio later or at the moment recreated at, at home because of COVID time. But um, I don't, yeah, I'm not, my work is all about the people that surround me and about the places that kind of inspire me. So it is, it's a kind of a, a visual diary of life in Dublin. Networks are really important, I think, when you're an artist, like developing relationships with, with other artists, with galleries, with um, institutions, you know. I mean, you can't be an artist without creating these, um, um, you know, these relationships with people. So, I mean, I think with any kind of practice, it's really important to be open and to be... Um, you know, to be friendly with people and to be, um, yeah, to be a kind of a, a, an open personality. I mean, you know, like when you, you know, when you're, when you talk about being an artist, there's this, um, I suppose there's this kind of belief that you're talking about kind of, you know, somebody who's grumpy, sitting in the dark all day, you know, full of angst, painting, painting their dark, depressive thoughts on canvas you know but I think that the reality of it is is that when you're an artist you need a support mechanism in order to get through the day whether it's the support of family friends um, loved ones or whether it's the support of you know people you've come up through college with and you go to exhibition openings with or, um, you know, you go and studio, regular studio visits with people, you know, and you need this, you know, you need, you can't spend all day yourself. I mean, you drive yourself insane that way, you know. You need some kind of buffer with reality. You, you know, you need to, um, you know, you need to kind of create friendships in the industry because, I mean, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're trying to become an artist and, I mean, realistically, you can't go up to, like, you know, somebody like, I don't know, the Kerwin Gallery and say, I want you to represent me, you know? I have this great vision for my future, all right? You need to kind of create a relationship with people like that, you know? And you need to kind of foster a good dialogue with them and... Yeah, you, know, you need to kind of it needs to be it needs to be natural, 
it needs to kind of come from a good place, you know. It can't just be, uh, you know, it can't be kind of, um, it can't be pushed, it can't be shoved, you know. You need a great um, foundation of the of other people in order to become an artist, even if you are working, even if the, your practice is solo, you need other people in your life in order to progress it. It's, re it's really hard to, to, to do, to become an entre, you know, to become like a professional artist. And I think it's, I think, it, I think, it, I think it might actually be more difficult to become a professional artist in somewhere, you know, in a small country like Ireland, because, um, I mean, you know, you could be lucky and you could get pieces accepted into like summer shows like the RHA and stuff, and you could be really lucky and somebody could buy them and, you know, or you can go to like um, the uh, RDS Arts Fair and sell small pieces, you know, and you can kind of, you know, you can build up a career on small things like that. But I think in order to in order to become like a, a full, a fully established professional artist, you need to gain recognition outside of Ireland. Like you need to get it from the UK, the US, somewhere like that, where they have this um, a more established art market, and they have um, more. Um, um, I mean, because here in Ireland we have the Arts Council, which is great. But I mean, we're such, it's such a small country and the Arts Council is so limited. And there is so many, um, so many people trying to make it as an artist and as a creative here in this country that um, it's really difficult to get a foot in somewhere like that because you're, you know, you're approaching them with a project but they're also being approached by somebody who's really established and who's been around for 20 years. So they're going to go with them probably, you know? So you need to, um, so it's kind of, it is, it's really difficult to, there is a certain um, aspect of luck needed in order to get it. But also you just need to kind of keep pushing and to keep, um, you know, to be bullheaded and to just say, you know, I don't, I don't care what the what I don't care what my parents say. I'm going to make it as an artist one day. <laughs> With this whole kind of COVID thing going on now, I think one of the things that they brought in, which they said would never work, is the um, is that um, you know the 350 euro a week. Um, pandemic rate which is basically like a, a minimum living wage for people you know for everybody in the country and I mean they said that would never work and like now over one million people are getting it you know and I think that you know if it's if it's worked creatively and properly I think they could probably come up I don't I, I wouldn't say they'd necessarily want to but I'd say that there could be some, um, you know, some kind of um, um, buffer put in for early career artists so that they can kind of focus on it. Because, I mean, Ireland has always been seen as such a creative country. And Ireland has always been seen as somewhere where, you know, you know, we, we foster the best artists, they say, and they take great pride in, in, in the arts in Ireland, but then they don't, they don't really, um, they don't put the, you know, they put, they say it, but they don't do anything about it really. And I think that one of the things that could really help artists in this country, like especially early career artists coming out of college, is if they, you know, they made some kind of um, uh, minimum living wage for them, 
and for you know like not just painters but everybody like photographers writers and stuff because then they could they could practice on it and they wouldn't necessarily have to get a part-time job in mcdonald's just to get by and then you know we we'd have a much more exciting i think um atmosphere going on in the country now i mean there's great artists around everywhere in ireland i mean coming up when i was coming up through college i was surrounded by some brilliant artists and go and see like the degree shows every year you see you see like brilliant work coming out but they have no way to make that link from or they're not willing to make the sacrifices needed at the moment you know like don't start a family until you're mid 30s you know you can never buy a house you can never you know you'll be renting all your life you can't um, you know, you can't invest, you can't, you know, you're living hand and mouth pretty much for your life, you know. And there, you know, there's so many great artists coming up who are terrified of that. So they'll go get a job in AIB, you know, and, and then they'll come back to it maybe when they're retired. But, I mean, you see, like, and it's it's such a pity that there is so much kind of great work and brilliant kind of um creativity coming from ireland and it always has but i think that we don't have a system in place to help people like that properly and so i think that you know you're really kind of you're really just kind of pushing along until you can break through really you know and you're lucky enough to get a show and you know, maybe I don't know if you in London somewhere, and then somebody will see you, and then they'll say, "Oh, we loved your work. Come and show our, come and show your work here. Come and you know, give talks here." And then, eventually, if you're lucky, you might get a job teaching part time and moving up the ladder. And then, finally, like <laughs> finally, when you're about sixty, you'll start making money. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I mean, I think that there's certain, um, I mean, as an, as an artist, I suppose we become obsessed with um, making a living and um, trying to um, just get by. And that's just because everybody does that, you know, from, you know, it doesn't matter if you're an artist or if you, you know, I don't, if you're a scientist or if you work in Spire, everybody is always concerned with where the next paycheck will come from or where, you know, where the next mortgage payment will come from. But I think that there is, there is this kind of, there is a great atmosphere in Ireland for creativity. There is, you know, like, there's great institutions like the RHA, National Gallery, IMA, you know, um, the visual in Carlo, you know, there's great institutions all over the country who foster creativity and um, would um, work with artists of all caliber, you know, and all um, stages of their career. And there's a great respect for artists from people, you know, like, um, when I go to exhibition openings in like the RHA, you know, back in normal time, outside of COVID time, you see people there who, you know, who are just leaving the office of a Thursday evening and come along for a bit of, a bit of an unwind from creativity or a bit of an unwind from the office life to embrace the creativity that goes on in Ireland. And I think that there is there is um, there is a great respect that goes on for every kind of art, whether it's visual art or um, cinematic art or you know written art. You know, um, there is 
there's great institutions in place for helping people like that. And there's great press in place for helping people like that. And also there's, um, there's great kind of humanity, I suppose, <coughs> from, um, uh, you know, from just your average, your average Joe who would, you know, I don't know, um, work in a garage and then come home and read Emily Pine and uh, something like that, you know? And there is this, there's this great kind of, um, Ireland has always been a great creative country and the people have always um, really respected that and really admired that. And we take great pride in our creative country, but I think we just need better systems in top, from the top in place in order to help people fully realize their potential as artists but i think that there is still there is still a great atmosphere in this country of creativity and plus now with um new systems in place like um zoom and you know where you can converse with people from other parts of the country or other parts of the world and there is this kind of great globalization of art as well or like Instagram, where um, you know you could post something on Instagram, and then some random, I find some random illustrators from Russia always always like my posts, and I have no idea who they are, but I love just kind of scrolling through their work, you know. <laughs> and there is this great, there's this great kind of globalization now for creativity, and for fostering that creativity. Whether it's, you know, whether it's, I don't know, going to the cinema to see the latest Marvel movie or going to see um, the latest pa Pedro Almodovar movie or going to, you know, going to see um, one of um, Tracy Emin's shows with William Blake and the take, you know, there is this, there's, there's a great kind of, um, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose there's, an amazing atmosphere for creativity around. And I think that there is this, there's this great respect. I mean, on one hand, people love art and they'll say, oh, you're an artist, that, you're, that's brilliant. But on the other hand, you'll say, oh, I'm an artist. And they'll probably think to themselves, oh, he's an artist. Oh, he'll never make a living. He'll never be good enough for my Susie. <laughs>
I'll do it tomorrow. And then you realize, oh, it's only two days. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start working. <laughs>some ways you you relate to all of them in your practice i mean they're all things that come you know they're all hurdles that you have to figure out some way to overcome at some point you know and they're usually hurdles that you you know when you're first starting you're when you're first starting to become an artist after you know after university usually or even if you're self-taught they're you know like things like um how to how to make applications how to work with others if you're you know if that's your practice you know if you're if you're collaborative or you know you you know working on working in this in a specific system of the arts where you need to work with others like maybe you're a filmmaker and you need to you know you need to rally a whole crew around you or something you know or um if you're an author, you, you you know you need to you need to um, be able to communicate and work well with publishers and stuff. Or if you're you know if you're a visual artist, you need to communicate with galleries in order to show your work so people will see your work so you, you'll get recognition for your work. You know, so yeah, they're all they're all hurdles that you have to overcome. <coughs> but usually you have to. I think they're I think that the only the only one in that list I think wouldn't um um people wouldn't like you wouldn't think of when you're becoming a creative might be the sustainability one but I think that is one that increasingly we need to start thinking about like I was reading a report that says we have about 50 years until Africa and India are as hot as the Sahara, you know? And I mean, I mean, there's like, there's so much waste in everything. And in the creative world, you know, like, you know, um, like nowadays I try to reuse as much old paper as I can. You know, I, um, I try to, um, you know, I, I try to, reuse as much paint as I can you know you want to um we all need to figure out ways of creating a proper sustainability in our practice or else you know in the long run it won't matter if we're (laughs) if we spend all day creating art because there won't be you know there won't realistically you know if people if people are, you know, if the worst happens and there's a giant climate emergency, people are not going to be worried about saving their Picassos. People are going to be worried about feeding their families, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, in, cre- in the past, I think that was prob- that one would probably have been one of the, would probably be something that artists wouldn't have thought about or would have thought about the least. But I think that they're all important aspects of starting to practice as an, art, as an artist. But I think that that one, I think, needs to move, like, and that one needs to be foremost in people's thoughts now, coming forward. Because, yeah, I mean, you know, we have the coronavirus now, which is terrible. But it's showing us how connected as a, as a world we are, and also how um, you know how great we are, kind of um, coming together and you know helping other people and um, uh, running you know running um, running the world in a safe and secure way. I mean you know, the sky is so clear now and there's no planes overhead. But, um, I mean, with, with exceptions, you know, 
I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to name names, but you know who I'm talking about, you know? <laughs> but I think that, yeah, as a creative, that whole list, which I'm not going to name because I can't remember them all now, is really important. Um, they're really important um, things that people have to think about at some point and have to try to figure out their own way to navigate those problems and have to figure out their own way to address these situations as they come forward in their practice. Communication with others. You have to be able to um, communicate on some level with others, whether it's gallery owners, whether it's other artists, other creatives, people who might want to purchase your pieces. But you need to be able to, um, you know, you need to give to the gal. Um, bloody mindedness. You need to be able to say, this is what I am, this is who I am, this is what I do, and I am not going to stop, no matter the, no matter the obstacles, I'm going to find a way to get through those obstacles, I am, I'm an artist, and this is who I, who I have always been, and who I will always be, um, and, um, uh, Flexibility. You need to be able to be flexible as an artist. You know, like um, you, you need, uh, having a timetable is great for people, and you know it's handy for artists as well to be able to say, "Oh, I'll go into the studio all day that day." But you might get an email when you're in the studio when you go in in the morning that needs to be addressed. You know. And then you might say, oh, I didn't do anything in the studio today. But you need to be able to, you need to be able to be flexible as an artist as well. Um, because you're running, basically you're running a business and a, create, a, cre a creative business and a business business yourself. So you need to constantly figure out a way to balance the two. You know? Entrepreneurship and the arts have always been um, inextricably, inextricably linked. Like um, even going back to like the Renaissance, where you'd find somebody, somebody to to a patron for your arts, um, and you'd work with them on creating your career as an artist, and then coming up. And you know, like the new, um, um, like um, uh, British artists working with Sachi in the eighties and nineties. You know, there you need to, um, you need to have, you you need to be able to balance, and you need to have a bit of both, a creative and a business mind in order to become an artist. And it's just because of the world we live in, you know, like you can't just kind of, you know, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to become an artist and get a studio and run one through studio and make work. And then, you know, just say, I'm an artist, you know, if you want to become, if you want to make a career and a living as an artist, you need to, um, you need to uh, you need to be an entrepreneur as well. You need to be able to um, to kind of um, uh, figure out ways to pay bills and to do taxes and uh, all that stuff, you know. But um, you know, or ideally, when I get better known, I'll have somebody else to do it for me. You know, that's the dream. Somebody else to do your taxes, you know. <laughs> Well, I think that there isn't enough prep, there isn't nearly enough preparation in um, the business aspect of art as there should be, or even um, 
um, creating personal relationships with um, like galleries and stuff like that. That's it's all something that you have to learn how to do yourself through trial and error after university. I mean, look, well, <clears throat> when I was in my degree in NCD, there was no mention of it whatsoever. I mean, if you had like, I don't know, a couple of hours a week, people would give out about it and say, you're getting in the way of me drinking, of us drinking in Red Square. But it would really be beneficial, you know, just to have somebody explain to you, you know, come in and say, this is how you, um, you know, this is a good way to do forms for, um, for grant applications. This is a good way to, um, to um, put yourself out online, you know. This is a good way to, um, this is a good example of um, uh, how to approach um, uh, representatives or something, you know. But um, when I was in my master's, we, we dipped into that. And we did have, um, occasionally we had some great talks from people from like VAI who would come by with examples of grant applications and say, this is, you know, this is a good, uh, a good way to do it. But they only came, came, they only come by once in a while and they only come by once. So if you're not in a good headspace that day, you're going to, you know, you, you're going to miss it, you know? And I think they need to, I think, you know, even if they just had maybe one afternoon a week, just like two hours, and then each week they said, um, oh, hey, <coughs> look at this application, example application for a grant and write something about your own practice for it. And then brought it in and people could look at their other people's and, you know, we need... Like art college is great for meeting other artists and for you know occasionally meeting um, curators and stuff, but um, um, but there needs to be there needs to be a bit um, um, a bit more um, work put into it. <coughs> we need a bit more. Um, um, yeah, we need a bit, um, a bit more emphasis put on it, really, in university level teaching. Um, I mean, there's, you yeah, yeah, you teach yourself when you're in, when you leave university, which is just it's such a waste of time. I mean, <clears throat> you're trying to, you're trying to make work. You're trying to show the work, but then you're also spending so much time making errors <coughs> in applications that you could, you know, that if they had spent a bit of time in university showing you how to do it, you would have a jumping start then after, after university. And you wouldn't stumble as much in making applications after university. <laughs>
where people say this is going to be great exposure. You know, you just have to put a, you know, unless it's working with somebody that you really admire or that you really think that could lead to something that would really help me later on in my career. There's just, um, <coughs> there's just so much, um, um, there's just too many um, people who want to get everything for free from you. And you just, you know, I think that's one of the biggest things as an artist you need to learn is to say no, is to be able to say, no, you know what? I appreciate, I appreciate you coming to me about that. And I appreciate you saying those nice things about my practice. But if, if you're not willing to pay me the proper you know, the going rate that I ask for for my work, you're not willing, then I'm not willing to share my work with you. And you need, you know, you need to be firm with people like that. And I think that's one of the major things that and building, um, building a, um, a support network, which I'm starting to do now, of curators, um, curators and, um, galleries around who will show my work um, and then uh, hopefully the millions will come from that this has been the zoom room sessions with our thriving tribe this has been visual artist harry walsh foreman harry if people want to find out more about your work and what you do what's your website what's your handles uh, um, Foreman.com website um, at Harry Walsh Foreman Artist is my Instagram handle. Brilliant. Harry, thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.